Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our regular uh, third Thursday of every month adaptation community meeting. Uh, for those who don't know or are new to this experience, um, these are an opportunity uh, for discussion on issues related to climate change, adaptation, and resilience. Uh, they've been going on for some time now, probably I want to say six, seven years, uh, and they cover a very wide range of, of topics. Um, so I would say if anyone who is interested, um, uh, who has a topic uh, themselves or their organization that they might like to present, um, let us know. There is actually a, a link on the climatelinks.org website uh, for the ACMs. And you can, uh, uh, you know, propose a, a session. So I would encourage that. Uh, as I say, we do these every third Thursday uh, of each month. Um, so we'll be doing one in March. Um, normally, we would be able to tell you what that uh, topic is, but um, it will be announced uh, shortly. Um, anything else? No. Okay. So with that, I will turn. Excuse me. Yes, there are there are cookies for those in the room. Uh, there are cookies and drinks in the back of the room. Please enjoy them. For those online, just uh, imagine you're enjoying them, I suppose. Uh, so with that, uh, we have a, a very good presentation today. I'll, I'm going to let um, Jonathan Cook from USAID uh, uh, provide some background and, and uh, um, introduce our speaker. Thank you, Chris, um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm Jonathan Cook from the Climate Change Office at USAID, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Judy today. Uh, we've known each other, actually, about a decade now, I guess, and it's um, been really interesting to follow the progression of this particular project, Hariovan. Um, we were just talking about the fact that this activity started in 2011 and um, actually is now into its second phase, in other words, a follow-on uh, second part, and so it's it's a really interesting uh, example of of a of a USA project that's done well, that's been able to continue with the same implementers, WWF, um, leading it with partners, and continue the good work that was started um, in the first phase. Um, it's a complicated project, I think it's fair to say. It, um, it, there were a lot of objectives uh, related to biodiversity conservation, um, climate mitigation, climate adaptation. Um, so a lot of activities, I think it must have been a, a challenging work plan uh, to write every year, but a lot of activities, a lot of lessons and successes and, and experiences to draw on. And Judy's back you now in Washington, but I know stays involved with the, the project as it's continuing in Nepal, so she's got a lot uh, a lot to say. I think we, we talked about all the possible presentations that she could give today on this project, but um, she's actually going to talk, I think, in in part at least, about a really interesting issue with um, with this project and just generally with adaptation, which is scale, and how to think about adaptation at different scales, local, um, subnational, national, and how they interrelate. Um, and so uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to, to hear about. So thanks, and here's Judy. Thank you. OK, well, it's really great to see everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, the Hario Ban program is funded by USAID in Nepal. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, it started in 2011 and is currently going till um, 2021 uh, in its second phase. Um, and the, it's, uh, I'm going to um, go through briefly, you know, describing Hario Ban, uh, and then I'm going to talk about again briefly, some background on how Nepal is vulnerable to climate, go through the work that we did at multiple scales, sort of going from community and actually household community level um, through watersheds to local jurisdictions, um, and then landscape, species and protected areas, and why we felt that we had to work at all these different scales for, for different functions. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about some of it. We learned a whole ton of lessons, but I've tried to focus it down. I'll talk about the major lessons that we learned in relation to, to scale. Um, 
So the program's goal at the moment in the second phase is to increase ecological and community resilience in two biodiverse landscapes in Nepal. Um, the main components now are biodiversity conservation and climate adaptation. In the first phase, we also had a sustainable landscape climate mitigation phase, um, but that, that component was dropped in the second phase. Uh, and then we have cross-cutting themes of gender and social inclusion and governance. Um, the program would not work without a ton of partnerships at different levels. The program is run by a consortium, uh, which is led by WWF. We have another international partner, CARE, so we have a conservation and a development partner international level, bringing in international tools and experience. Um, and then working with two national level organizations, FICA Fund, which is the Federation of Community Forest Users Nepal, which has over 18,000 um, community forest user group members, so really reaching down to grassroots. And the National Trust for Nature Conservation, which is working in several protected areas. So again, reaching right down to grassroots, to communities living in conservation areas and in buffer zones around protected areas. Um, we work very closely with the government of Nepal. We wouldn't be able to do the project without government. Um, and, but we also work with a, a lot of civil society organizations with the private sector, uh, universities, and, and so on. Um, and there's a, there's a very major community focus in the project. So the two landscapes that we work in, they're very uh, different landscapes. Uh, the Terai Arc landscape, which is in the south of Nepal, in the low-lying area, and the, the first range of hills, the Churia Hills. Um, it was set up, um, I guess, about 12, 13 years ago now. Uh, with the major objective to conserve species like tigers and rhino, reconnecting isolated populations in protected areas through corridors with links to India, um, but also benefiting local communities uh, through improved forest conservation and livelihoods and so on, um, and promoting economic development. And the, the, the next phase of the, the Terai Arc strategy also includes climate adaptation. I'll talk about that later. And then the other landscape, is very different. It's the Chitwan Annapurna landscape, which is a, a river basin. It's the Gandaki River Basin. Um, so it's going from over 8,000 meters in the high Himalaya to Annapurna, Langtang, uh, Manaslu conservation area, and then coming all the way down through the mid hills to the Terai and draining out to India. Um, so, how is Nepal vulnerable to climate? Well, um, we know that. Uh, Rainfall is changing. The monsoon is much less predictable than it used to be. Uh, and when it does rain, rainfall is often heavier than it used to be. So there's an increase in floods, um, and floods affecting local communities, but also affecting infrastructure uh, and sometimes causing landslides. And when landslides are near rivers, it increases the amount of sediment that's going into rivers. Um, and this is, gets carried downstream when the rivers flatten out in, in flat valleys. That sediment gets dumped as the water loses its energy. Uh, and this causes rivers to change course, uh, water to start flowing under, underground even under the sediment. So big changes for local communities living uh, in these lower parts as well um, in terms of their water supply, losing agricultural land from river cutting and so on. Um, because a lot of the rain is becoming concentrated, uh, you know, in 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 uh, intense rainfall, there are other times when it when it doesn't rain. Uh, farmers no longer know when to plant. Um, the rain may start and then it may stop, um, and so big impacts for agriculture. Uh, and the drought is also affecting local water supplies because so much water is running off in this intense rainfall, less water is percolating to aquifers and dry season flows, dry season water supplies are seriously affected in some areas. Um, wildlife is affected um, by floods but also by droughts and where wildlife have to move into areas of settlements and so on to look for water during drought, um, they may come into increased human wildlife conflict 
and so on. Um, during the 2017 floods, rhinos actually got washed out of Nepal and uh, down into India, and some of them were actually retrieved. <laughs> uh, they were, you know, they were colored, they were recognizable, uh, and they were they were brought back to Nepal. Um, so, you know, big impact from wildlife too. Um, diseases, people are seeing new diseases coming in, which could be because of changing climate conditions. Um, diseases affecting people and livestock, and we're also concerned about wildlife. Um, and then the other thing is, as if there are longer drier periods in the hot dry season, um, with uh, you know higher temperatures, lower relative humidity, there's a higher risk of forest fires. And if those burn hot and get into the canopy, and if they happen, you know several years running, then forests may lose their resilience to fire. So another concern. Um, people have. Uh, differential vulnerability. Some people are more vulnerable than others. Women tend to be more vulnerable because they're uh, less involved in decision making within the community. So they're not really having a say in some of the resources they're managing, like water and, and firewood, um, particularly affecting women headed households. Um, and then marginal people, poor marginalized people who, because of uh, poverty or because of, of their caste are marginalized by the community and they're having to live in extremely vulnerable places like, um, I don't know if you can see from there, but at the top of this landslide there's a, a house perched right there, which is a, a pretty vulnerable place to live. Um, so uh, there are also factors that are making ecosystems more vulnerable. So we, we know that ecosystems generally tend to be more resilient to climate change if they're in a healthy condition. If for a forest, for example, if there are large areas of forest, um, but there are many pressures on forests in Nepal that fragment them and degrade them. Uh, collection of natural resources is a big one, including firewood. Um, Overgrazing is a big factor. It's not quite as bad as it used to be in many areas because many people are destocking the general um, socioeconomic trend in Nepal, but some areas are still overgrazed. Um, and there's a big move to develop infrastructure, roads and hydropower, particularly irrigation, um, which is also fragmenting forests and, and degrading them. Uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing at the moment. If we look forward, um, we did some projections looking at what are the likely impacts of climate change on uh, Nepal's forests in the future. Uh, for this, we used um, we used global climate models and we used the A2A emission scenario, which is a pretty high um, emission scenario, but was the one that we were tracking at the time. Um, and so just looking at this, so this is uh, the forest cover in 2012, and I'm going to go through a series that's going to go to um, 2050 and then 2080. And you can see, I'll, I'll go back and do that again. Um, you can see as we go through the series that particularly the forests in the southern part of the country, um, down here in the in the south, are particularly affected. This uh, purple band, blue band up there, that's the higher coniferous forests. They're less affected, um, you know, going up towards the tree line in the mountains. Um, however, it's not all that bad. If we uh, look at micro refugia, so so. Those were regional models, um, which are pretty broad scale. Nepal's topography is so rugged and broken. You know, it's uh, it's not just one single south-facing slope up the mountains. It goes like that, cut by river valleys. So in these really steep river valleys, um, they're they're uh, they're cooler, they're damper, they have less sunshine. North and northwest facing slopes as well, they're cooler and damper, um, and so those are likely to be areas where species can persist for longer, and where people are also going to want to go as as the climate warms up. Um, so we know that these areas actually help uh, will help the forests to survive a bit better in the future. This is just using the regional model. Um, I'm sorry, the colors have changed from the previous map. And then if we add in the microclimate effects, you can see that at least some of the forests um, in the south here are um, more likely to persist. These are the ones that tend to be on the on north-facing slopes and valleys. 
Okay, so that's just a really quick picture of, of some of the main vulnerabilities um, to climate change. Um, we started doing a lot of work at community level because many of our partners were working at community level. It seemed an obvious place to start. Um, we realized that in order to have a very participatory process, we had to empower certain members of the community to be able to participate properly. And so women and poor and marginalized people uh, went through a process at the beginning to enable them to speak up and take part in community meetings. We then undertook um, climate vulnerability assessments with the communities working in focus groups, uh, looking at uh, what people have been experienced been experiencing so far and um, you know what might happen in the future but mainly with the communities it was what changes they're already seeing um, and and we documented this we actually did this for over 400 um, communities and and um, local authority areas in the two landscapes and the kinds of things that um, the activities that they planned as a result of their vulnerability assessments. There was a big focus on livelihoods. Um, for example, where um, rainfall was affecting agriculture, we worked on drip irrigation, um, trying to promote water efficiency, but helping people to have access to irrigation um, in times when rainfall was failing. Uh, so the uh, greenhouse is, is helping them to grow crops out of season, cash crops like tomatoes, um, to bring in household income at a time when um, incomes were badly affected by climate change. We also worked on a few forest products where they could be harvested sustainably, um, so cane furniture, for example. And then, but for many people, uh, we worked on um, off-farm activities, trying to build skills so that they could get employment, they could set up enterprises um, and um, diversify their household incomes that way. So, hence the, um, the lady sewing in the bottom left. Um, a lot of people, drought was one of the most common vulnerabilities that came up, um, people's water supplies dwindling. Uh, and so we did a lot of rainwater harvesting, um, storage tanks, and when we, when we did the storage tanks, we also worked with them to help to protect uh, the recharge areas and their water catchments, you know, remove cattle and goats from those areas so that, uh, so that the aquifers could be recharging, um, regenerating forests in the catchment. Uh, in a few cases, we did solar pumping where communities were up on top of a hill and their water supplies had dried up. Um, so pumping water up and saving women about four hours walk a day coming down and then going up with water. Um, we worked to increase ecosystem resilience. Um, sometimes it was um, removing those non-climate stresses that make forests less resilient. Um, so for example, the biogas in the top right hand corner, um, helping people um, reduce their uh, dependence on firewood. If they couldn't do biogas because they didn't have live, livestock for the dung, mm -hmm. um, then we did fuel efficient stoves. We also did microhydro in some places and well, we provided some support to microhydro and, and solar energy. Um, we helped to stop erosion. Um, we did a lot of tree planting with local communities as part of their um, community forest operational plans, which we tried to make climate smart. Um, and then restored other areas like wetlands, um, where wetlands were maybe filling up, um, drying out. Um, people would deepen them, um, maybe channel in um, storm water uh, to retain water for both for people and livestock, um, but also for wildlife. Part of the ecosystem restoration included restoring landslide sites uh, with more intense rain from climate change. Um, the, the risk of landslides increases, and, and um, Nepal has a huge risk of landslides. Um, so as much as possible, we use bioengineering, but sometimes we combined it with gabions or other engineering structures, just depending on the local situation and, and what was feasible in terms of engineering. Um, a lot of landslides occurred after the 2015 earthquake. 
or in the following couple of rainy seasons. So we did a lot of work with local communities after the earthquakes as well to try to stabilize um, new, new landslides or um, stabilize areas that looked like they were at risk of sliding um, because of the effects of, of climate change. And this was also a, a valuable cash for work program where we were able to help communities get back on their feet after the disaster by getting injecting cash into the local economies. Um, with a special focus on women, needy people, disabled people as well. Um, we also worked on um, reducing vulnerability to floods, and I've sort of used this as a demonstration to show how working at community level was great, everything that I've told you so far, but it actually wasn't enough. So, for example, there was one community in the Taraya Taru, an ethnic community, who lived in a flood-prone area, and previous projects had given them a boat. And so every time the flood came, they would just get a climb in the boat and they'd go up in the flood. And then they'd come down again. So they asked us for some life jackets, which we provided. And that was great. And they actually were able to use those life jackets to save the lives of some people in the neighboring community as well. So that was great. But really, we were just treating a symptom. We weren't treating the cause. And we weren't really helping them. Um, you know, to, to overcome the floods. Uh, sometimes the floods would be so bad that people would actually have to leave their homes and um, go and develop um, shelters in forests where, uh, in many cases, it was illegal. It was considered illegal squatting, even although they were there because of the result of floods, um, which brought them into conflict with local authorities and so on. So. We're trying to work to reduce these kinds of situations. Um, one community in the in the tribe, or well, several communities in the Tarai, <laughs> realized that if they uh, restored their floodplains, they could try and, and hold back flood water and protect their villages. So this is a particular community which removed livestock, which had been heavily grazing the floodplains, but the water was just running across it like sheep. Um, and once they removed the livestock, they got this fantastic green growth of grass and then shrubs on the higher ground. And it worked really, really well in the 2014 floods. The water came, but it slowed the water down. The sediment dropped in this area, and actually the ground level started to rise up, which gives them added protection. But the problem was that they were only on one side of the river, and the people on the other side of the river became even more vulnerable because this tended to divert the water to the other side. So. All of this was you know, an increasing realization that actually it's not enough in many cases to work at just with a single community. You have to look upstream and downstream and, and see what you can do in a, in a more holistic way. Um, so this led us to working uh, in, in watersheds. Um, so rather than just sitting around and trying to build uh, you know, little embankments to keep the flood out, we actually needed to go and talk to the people upstream to see if there was any, any changes we could make in land use up there um, to try to retain water and reduce the flooding. Um, a major effort uh, in this respect was in the Pokhara Valley. Pokhara is the second biggest city in Nepal, and it's a, it's a big tourism center. There's a lake, the Fewa Lake, which is actually sedimenting up. You can you can see the way it's silting up, um, and already a large surface area of the lake has has, has been lost. And as climate change advances and there are more landslides and, and erosion, um, the sediment rate is only going to increase. So the hotel association in in Pokhara is obviously very concerned about this. They they uh, want their tourists to see the lake. It's a big attraction. Um, and so we managed to set up a payment for ecosystem services system whereby they actually pay upstream farmers and users to reduce the erosion. Um, they're doing things like putting in shade coffee instead of annual crops, um, trying to stabilize roads that may have been badly designed, um, not properly drained, and they're eroding away. Um, and so it's through projects like this that we can, we can really work upstream and downstream and, and try to make a difference. Uh, none of this can sort of happen in a vacuum, and we also learned this the hard way. You know, we produced a lot of community adaptation plans, but um, we had limited funds to help people to implement them. And there was a risk that 
you know, they might eventually just sit on the shelf because there were, there were no more resources, no more support for them. Um, and so we took them and worked with the local authorities to mainstream them into local level planning. Uh, so we did this with the local village development committees and municipalities. Um, and in this way, they would become part of local plans. Um, local government has, has ongoing funds. And so this was a way to get the, the plans fully implemented and was really important whenever there was any major infrastructure that needed building because um, our project didn't have enough funds for that. Um, since uh, Nepal got a new constitution in 2015, it's in the process of establishing new municipalities, which are actually a bit bigger than the village development committees. They cover a bigger area. And so they're covering whole, um, what Nepal calls, sub-watersheds, which is actually great because now there's local authority that can deal with a sub a whole sub-watershed. Um, and so we're now working with them uh, to build capacity for the newly elected representatives, uh, build capacity in climate adaptation and planning, um, and, uh, and working to uh, mainstream climate adaptation, as well as disaster risk reduction. Um, and this is also, as I mentioned, a good way of leveraging funds for adaptation. And this is just from phase one, so it's a bit different now, but um, approximately 70% of the funding for the plans that we worked on came from the project, um, but we were getting a growing amount coming from local authorities. Communities were also putting in some of their own money, you know, that they're making from forest operations and so on. Um, and then other donors was, was another contribution. But we realized that actually some processes are bigger than watersheds even, and we needed to go bigger than that. We did vulnerability assessments for each of the landscapes. Um, you know, looking at how um, uh, ecosystems, vegetation, um, fresh water was vulnerable, but also looking at how agriculture was vulnerable, how infrastructure was vulnerable, and human activities, as, as well as uh, natural processes. And Ryan sitting here was uh, kind enough to help us with these. Um, and this helped us to understand better those bigger processes. Um, within ecosystems and equipped us to be able to tackle some of the larger scale vulnerabilities. Sorry, this might be a bit pale, but it's, it's off the internet. But this is a map of uh, dam development, hydropower development in Nepal. And I'm sorry, the people online can't see, but I'm just indicating the sort of the lines along the river valleys of the clusters of, um, you know, hydropower development. The orange ones are, um, uh, you know, they have survey licenses, the, the dark blue ones are actually operational, and then the green and light blue ones are, well, the green ones are under construction, and the light blue ones, they've applied for construction licenses. So not all of these will happen, but you can see what's tending to happen. And if you get a whole run of dams in one stem of a river, they're all going to affect each other, you know, the sediment, the construction. Um, and if, it, if they're storage dams, then obviously they're going to be holding back water and discharging at different times. Um, a lot of them are run so-called run-of-the-river projects, but not all. Um, and so there's a big need to bring them together to ensure that the designers and operators actually understand the scenarios for future climate change, um, because they're going to be badly affected by drought. They already are in the monsoon. In the, in, sorry, in the dry season, the pole is really short of power. Um, but then during the rainy season, if there are serious floods, um, they will also be adversely affected. This is from the um, upper Dudkosi. A big cloudburst happened on the Chinese side, came down the river, um, tragically killed a number of people in the border town, uh, wiped out this, this um, hydropower plant, took out the road. Um, and that area is kind of like a ghost town now. So these are the kinds of things that we, we've got to be aware of and, and plan for. Um, all the development that's going on in Nepal, hydropower and roads, is using a huge amount of building material. Often that comes from riverbeds. And then if you have floods coming, it increases the sedimentation downstream. So it just it, it compounds the effects of climate change. 
Um, and then roads, it's, a, it's an amazing terrain to have to be building roads and there are huge numbers of new roads going in. Very often they're not properly designed. In fact, um, local roads are often, the route's often chosen by the bulldozer driver. He just gets in and he goes like this and he may get up to here and find he can't go any further so he comes back down and then he goes up there. And I've talked to community forests who have virtually lost all of their forests because a road has gone through like that. But it's not just forests, people lose agricultural land. Um, blasting for larger roads may affect aquifers and so on. So there, there, are, there are huge impacts. Um, and so again, you know, if we can work with hydropower, if we can work with, uh, with um, government planning roads um, and have good design that, that is um, going to withstand future climate impacts, um, it's so much better for everybody. At uh, this large scale as well, there are um, ecological processes going on. The river valleys, this is, this is the Gandaki Basin, the Chichuan Annapurna landscape. Um, the river valleys are used as migration routes for fish and for birds um, going to higher ground and coming back down. Um, it's much easier for a bird to fly along a river valley than to go up and down and up and down. Um, given Nepal's very tortuous topography. Um, and these are, these are important corridors. And with climate change, we know that species are going to want to move to cooler, um, damper places as temperatures warm up. Um, and for them, rather than, you know, rather than tree species having to do this kind of thing, if they can also be migrating up river valleys, then it's going to be much easier for them. However, there's a lot of pressure on these valleys. There are transport routes, there's agriculture, there are settlements and so on and so forth. Um, this is a view of what these river valleys look like in the mid-hills. This is the confluence of the Seti and the Trishali River. It's actually a sacred site. There's a little temple and the, and the confluence there. Um, but in this area, uh, there's a lot of um, deforestation fragmentation. You can see that this is the corridor coming up here, and you can see with these red rectangles, these are areas where the corridor is particularly broken, um, forest cover has, has been destroyed um, for agriculture or settlement or whatever. Um, so we've been working to try to restore these corridors. In this area where I showed you the photograph, uh, for example, we've been working with the local the district forest officer and the local communities. They've been planting broom grass, which is an indigenous grass that stabilizes the soil. It's a great big grass up to here with these amazing flowers that you can turn into sweeping brooms. And everybody in Nepal and India sweeps their house with these brooms. So there's a huge market. They wear out after a bit and you throw them away and get another one. Um, so these people are making brooms, selling them. They no longer have to do slash and burn agriculture, which had destroyed the forest. And as part of their leasehold agreement with the district forest officer, they also restore forests. So this is a way of eventually um, helping to restore the forest and benefiting the local communities who are living there. Um, so we, we took the climate vulnerabilities and the possible solutions and we're actually able to mainstream them into uh, the landscape strategies, the revised one for the Triarch and then the new one for the brand new um, Chichuan Annapurna landscape that the project helped to establish, helped government to establish. Um, within the landscapes there are protected areas and protected areas are a bit of a special case in terms of climate adaptation. Unlike a, you know, a tree species or a wildlife species that may be able to move, protected area boundaries tend to be pretty fixed usually. And that's probably other land uses going, going on around, so it may, not, it may not be possible to extend them. Um, and so sometimes, you know, the objectives of protected areas may have to change in line with climate change. For Manaslu conservation area, we were able to um, look at what the main vulnerabilities were to different aspects. So we looked at um, major species uh, like musk deer and snow leopard, and then uh, major tree species like um, uh, blue pine, for example, and birch. And then we look at, at, looked at the different ecosystems, the social systems, the different communities, uh, the livelihood activities, including agriculture and livestock, non timber forest products, and then infrastructure like microhydro and settlements and monasteries and roads. 
and trails. Um, looking to see how all of those things were vulnerable and what could be done um, within the management plan to build resilience, uh, to take those vulnerabilities into account. Um, in terms of species, each species has a different vulnerability depending on its characteristics, um, its range, whether it has a white tolerance, narrow tolerance, um, how abundant it is and so on. This is black buck, which is a species that used to be really uh, common in Nepal, but is, has become very restricted to one small reserve uh, in the Terai. And was, we were a bit concerned that it was only there in one place, quite vulnerable. So early in the project, we started establishing a second population in Suklafanta Wildlife Reserve in the, in the west, which is what the main photograph is. Uh, and we were really glad we did that because in 2014, there was a really bad flood in the original reserve and they lost about 40 animals, 40 out of, I think, 200 animals. So it was a big chunk of the population to lose. The warden in that area um, then came to us and asked for a, a grant to build some mounds. The whole area is quite low-lying and the water just kind of runs across it in a sheet during the floods. And so he built some mounds about three feet high that the black buck could go and stand on during the floods. We didn't know if it was going to work or not. But there was a, an even bigger flood in 2017, and they did actually go and use it. They, they lost about 18 animals, but that's better than losing 40. Um, and over, I think, about 240 animals survived the flood on these mounds. He's going to adapt them. I think some of them he's going to make them even bigger. Maybe he's going to move some bit in different places. But um, it's, it's one way, it's a little bit extreme, but it's one way of showing how you can help species to adapt. Another question is, uh, you know, what should we do about tree species? We're doing a lot of forest restoration, but the species we're planting now may not survive in these areas, you know, in 50, 100 years' time. And you plant a tree, it's, it's for a long time. It's not like an annual agricultural crop that, where you have a lot more flexibility. You can change crops if, if one crop stops being suitable. Um, and so we started to look at, you know, what trees should we be planting? Um, we, we did some modeling. I, again, models are only as good as the information that goes into them, and there's you know, lots, of, um, lots of reasons to be cautious of them. But this is, um, so that down here, this is in the bottom right. Um, this is sal forest. Sal is um, a very valuable timber tree. It grows a lot in the lowlands and the lower parts of the mid hills, and it's the most sought after species for, for timber. It's very hard, it's termite resistant. Um, so we modeled that and other species as well, and saw that now this is um, the, the paler green color is the current distribution, and then the darker green is future distribution. And you can see it in this model, it's tending to move up the river valleys. Um, and to the north. So, you know, it's possible that it's, it's going to be struggling to survive down here. And this was, this model is to 2050. I mean, again, you know, if we'd used a different uh, climate scenario, we'd have got different results. But, but it's indicative of the kinds of changes that may happen. Um, the forest department currently has an 80-year rotation for SAL. So you can see that, you know, maybe there's a need to think about um, diversifying a bit. Um, if communities want to um, promote sal, then that's great, but, but do it in the upper areas. Um, we, we did this for a number of species. We also had a grantee who did uh, um, germination and establishment trials for some of these tree species. And so we were able to get a bit of idea that, you know, some species are more resilient than others, some are, are, are quite vulnerable. Um, and we're turning that into general guidance. But with a lot of cautions, we need some more direct observations. It's not really very clear to see what's happening yet. But um, anyway, this was, we were working on this. And this would all be part of, of um, trying to ensure ecosystem resilience. You know, if you plant the right species now, um, the forest is hopefully going to flourish in the future. Communities can still derive benefits from, it, from them, even if the species composition is a bit different. So, uh, I've gone through a lot of different levels. I deliberately haven't 
talked about national level because um, it would be a whole other story. And we did have some policy inputs, but uh, um, I wanted to concentrate on you know what we were doing on the ground. And then because we were funded nationally by uh, USAID Nepal, we didn't in fact do any. We didn't think about any um, transboundary effects, uh, although. WWF has been doing some work on that, but I, I haven't um, I haven't covered that. But it's also important to to do because um, you know the, there is a there is a lot of interplay between, for example, Nepal and India. Um, you know, extra sediment is going down into India. India has barrages that during floods back up into Nepal and cause problems. So so there's a kind of a two way process there. And then I mentioned the flood that came down from China and, and seriously affected the Dode Koshi. Um, so these, these levels are also important, but I'm focusing on these uh, subnational levels at the moment. So what were some of the major lessons? Well, um, taking this multiple scale approach, let us focus on the most vulnerable people. Um, and we could work at different scales and across different disciplines like agriculture and water and disaster risk reduction and so on. Um, to help to reduce people's vulnerability, really focusing in on what they were, you know, how they were most vulnerable. Um, it let us integrate uh, ecosystem and community adaptation approaches and helped us to avoid maladaptation. Um, so, you know, doing something upstream, for example, that could badly affect people downstream, even if unintentionally. Um, it provided a a really flexible approach. I mean, we didn't work this all out at the beginning. It was a series of um, hard learned lessons as we as we went through and finding out that what we were doing wasn't enough and we had to do something more and so on. Um, so this let us, you know, gave us a lot of flexibility. And this was actually the great thing about our funding. Um, it wasn't for a particular type of adaptation. It, you know, it wasn't for agriculture or it wasn't for water. It was for However, people in nature were vulnerable to climate change. And that was really, really valuable. Um, and the fact that we have 10 years for the project also really helped. I mean, five years was not quite enough, especially with the earthquake. Um, having 10 years really, really helped us to learn the lessons and apply them in, in the second phase. Um, and then also, yeah, taking no regrets approach, um, you know, doing things in steps where, um, you know, Climate change might go one way or another way. Development might go one way or another way. So, you know, not closing doors, but um, doing things in, in phases in light of, you know, growing uncertainty in the future. It does, working at these multiple levels requires a huge amount of participation and collaboration, uh, and hence, obviously, facilitation across disciplines, across levels, between communities, between ministries, you know, and 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 so um, this was this was a, a, a chunk of time and a chunk of effort that I think we hadn't realised at the beginning was was going to be needed. Um, and some sectors, you know, were were more difficult to work with than others. Um, and it also presents challenges where the natural boundaries don't coincide with the jurisdictional boundaries, and you have to have some trade-offs there. It's, as I mentioned, it's easier now with the municipalities because each municipality on average covers maybe three or four or five um, sub-watersheds. So we have a number of contained units there. Uh, but previously, when it was village development committees, they would maybe be sharing a sub-watershed with another VDC, and that was very difficult to, to plan for. Um, but there are still challenges. You know, the new provinces are splitting river basins, and so they're going to have to learn to um, manage joint resources. Uh, and, and with the new constitution, there are a whole lot of new challenges, as well as opportunities um, for adaptation in the future. So this is it. This is um, really what I, what I wanted to say. Uh, like to express our gratitude to all of our partners this was not double deaf alone doing this work. You know, our consortium, our the communities we worked with, the civil society partners, the government, um, private sector, everybody um, played an important role. And we're very grateful to USAID for the funding. So I'd be happy to answer questions.
everyone's thinking of theirs. Um, well, thanks, Judy. That was great. Um, and I always learn something new about the project when I hear you present. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the the subnational institutions that you worked with, in other words, government. Um, just if you could say a little bit about their capacities, their interests, their you talked about, of course, them being involved, but just a little more on how they were involved and how that set of relationships worked. Yeah. Um, we worked a lot with the village development committees or urban municipalities, as they were then, um, and then also with districts. Uh, but with the constitutional, that the institutional structure has changed. Um, capacity for adaptation was generally very low. Um, we started off doing uh, a, a sort of a cascading capacity building. So we did training at um, national level. We brought in national level people and district level people. We trained them. A lot of them were government, but some of them were NGO. And then the expectation was that those trainers would go off and train people at more local level and um, including um, re Nepal has a great system of local resource persons um, who work at local community level. And so we expected them to get trained and, and then they would would um, pass climate messages on to communities and, and it would, would sort of cascade. It, it sort of worked, but I would say um, we realized about halfway through the first phase, we actually hadn't really managed to build that much capacity in government. And so we went back and had a concerted effort. We did workshops, for example, for district forest officers and for um, wardens of protected areas. And the wardens were great. They were really, really interested. They were, you know, and, you know, they were really worried about their protected areas and what can we do? Um, and the district forest officers also had, had some, you know, good ideas. but. There wasn't really a culture of thinking about climate change. People had, you know, all sorts of other responsibilities to do, and so trying to bring this in was, you know, we we were we had to push quite hard. Um, in community institutions, um, we worked mainly with community forest user groups or buffer zone groups or um, uh, conservation area um, committees, depending on where they were. Um, Generally, those people are feeling the impacts of climate change already. They didn't necessarily know what it was caused by. We're very interested to learn and then talk about the changes they were seeing and, and what could be done about it. And um, obviously, you sort of benefit from implementing their plans. So we, we did build capacity, quite a lot of capacity at that level. And we were able to help them to mainstream climate into their um, forest operational plans. Or, um, buffer zone plans. Um, so I, I think we did build a bit of capacity. Um, with the new municipalities, there is a huge need. Now these are uh, now, they now have um, locally elected representatives which who were not present before. So a lot of new people with hopefully, you know, greater accountability and responsibility, but who generally know nothing about climate change. These are new people coming in. So there's a huge need to build the capacity of the new municipalities. A lot of the money will be going all the way down to municipalities. So they're going to have quite a lot of money to spend. So it's, it's a great opportunity. But you know that that capacity has to be has to be built. Um, and then also at, um, at the level of the new provinces. Um, because they're the ones who are going to be sharing river basins, some of them left and right bank, some of them upstream, downstream. And so that's going to be very important. Um, but generally, capacity was extremely low. We, we also tried to mainstream climate adaptation into university programs so that the next generation of foresters, farmers, you know, agriculturists, whoever, um, will come out you know, knowing a, a bit more about climate change. Hi there, uh, my name is Ellie Anderson. I'm with the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, how health plays into this, particularly reproductive and maternal health. Sure, yeah, and that was the one thing that I didn't show um, just because of time, but we did also do some health interventions, um, most particularly wash, so um, water sanitation and hygiene because of the, um, the water situation. Um, 
but we did also, as we were empowering the local groups at the beginning before we did the vulnerability assessments, a lot of the women would talk about health needs, um, some not having access to services, partly because they were too far away, they had to walk four hours down a hill to get to a health clinic, or they, they weren't welcome when they got there because of their cost or whatever. And so we worked with them to, to strengthen their advocacy capacity. And in some cases, they did actually manage to advocate for health clinics 